Okay. Well, hello and welcome and thank you for joining us for this first Agro Lunch and Learn webinar of 2024. This webinar series is only possible through the generous support from Eurofins AgroScience Services. We thank Eurofins very much for their continuing sponsorship. My name is Laura McConnell uh, of a former agro chair and science fellow at the Bear Crop Science. I will be serving as a moderator today uh, for this webinar. Just a reminder that everyone should use the Q&A tool on your screen to submit your questions and comments. And uh, please you know, start asking your questions early, put them in the, in the Q&A box as we go along and that way we'll be sure to cover them all in the Q&A period after the seminar. So before I introduce our speaker, I'll highlight the benefits of becoming an Agro member. I can personally say there are a huge number of benefits. Um, it uh, enhances your science. You can build your scientific network. You can uh, uh, develop leadership skills and, um, and you know, really build a, an excellent community of colleagues. So please add the Agro Division to your ACS membership or go to agrodiv.org and click on become a member to become an affiliate member for only $20 a year, regardless of whether you're an ACS member or not. I'd also like to inform you about the upcoming ACS national meeting in Denver this August, please submit an abstract for one of our many sessions. There are also opportunities to apply for uh, students and early uh, uh, PI travel awards. So those require that you uh, submit an abstract along with an award application. So be sure to check that out. If you have any questions about programming, you can contact our program chair, Dr. James Foster, and you can see the agrodiv.org site for more details on how to contact James. So now I'm like very proud to introduce my colleague and today's speaker, Godwin Lemko. Uh, he is in uh, our regulatory scientific affairs team and he is the lead for Africa for our team at Bear Crop Science. And he is gonna give us a pretty um, nice introduction to himself. So I'm gonna allow him to, to uh, tell us about him, give us some more details about his uh, background and um, uh, things that he's done in his career himself. So he'll do a much better job than me, but uh, I'm so happy that he's here today. And uh, I think you're gonna really enjoy uh, his his webinar and uh, learn a lot because I know I have uh, in working with him on this. So um, Godwin, please uh, um, take it away. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you very, very much for, for having me. Let me just try and share my screen. Um, so, depending on where you're joining from, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for for this opportunity to uh, to share with you some of the um, highlights and, and and my thoughts about uh, ag innovations in 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 Africa. Let me see. Let me know, Laura, if you can see this in the presentation mode. Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you, and as, as uh, Laura mentioned, I uh, um, uh, Godwin, and I, I, I work with Bayer. I'm on the same team as as, as Laura, based here in Africa. So I'm based here in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so warm warm greetings from Nairobi. Um, so I would I would describe myself as as. Uh, as an again enthusiast, someone who really believes in the transformative potentials of uh, new and, and emerging breeding, breeding techniques. Uh, to uh, and and I've, I've spent the past seventeen years now uh, trying to um, 
to work in in the in this space, just building capacity and and trying to uh, drive functional systems that can enable um, these these technologies. So, I've I've worked in in close to twenty African countries now, tr- pursuing these these policy objectives and building enabling systems um, and and adequate capacity to be able to assess these technologies because I, I think it, these technologies would make um, a huge difference in 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 our agriculture and, and the way we feed ourselves. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'll share a bit more about that later. Um, so personally, and, and I've, I've made this a personal mission uh, to to just try and break down those policy barriers. I mean, there are great technologies out there, and then you come to this part of the world, you find we have these policy barriers that are really um, preventing us from having access to the, these kinds of technological innovations that um, other uh, developed and developing countries have, have access to completely revolutionize their their their, their agriculture. Um, so that, that that has been my personal mission for the past 17 years now, just to try and break down those policy barriers and make sure that these technologies actually make their way to the hands of, of, of farmers for uh, uh, a, a productive uh, food system here, here in Africa. My backgrounds are in uh, in food science and nutrition and uh, also in uh, specialized in ag, ag biotech, particularly the, the re- regulatory um, uh, process for, for ag biotech. Um, so as, as I mentioned, I work with Bayer. And uh, Bayer, as you know, is a life science company with three divisions. I happen to work with it in the crop science division. Um, with with a, a very big ambition, as health for all, hunger for none, and and we we've been uh, driving this uh, ambition uh, uh, globally uh, now, more so in in Africa, uh, seeing how important it is that we're able to um, feed feed such such a, a, a growing continent. Um, a bit more about uh, Bayer and our approach. So we took a, really a holistic um, approach to, to agriculture, because uh, what we're trying to do is to, to promote sustainability. We're, we're trying to produce, I mean, um, promote agriculture in a way that is socially responsible, um, so that, that can really help improve people's lives, but also as as we we know these days, this is becoming a really sensitive topic. Now it's how how to be an environmentally responsible. So how how to produce while still preserving the the environment, and that's quite a um a, a complex process that we're trying to uh, to, to figure out. And bear as an organization, trying to uh, do our bit to 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 make sure that we are promoting technologies that that would ensure environmental sustainability, but also uh, economic success for for the farmers that that we are serving. All of this in, in federance of the big paradox, because on the one hand we have um, a, a global population that is growing that we have to feed. On the other hand, we have climate emergencies uh, and uh, environment, uh, an environment that that we need we need to protect. So the question is to produce or or, or to 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 preserve. Now, this becomes even more evident in in, in Africa, being a continent that is one of the, the continent that is most impacted by by climate change, but also one of the continents with the fastest uh, growing population. Um, it's it's it, it, it's not a matter of whether to produce or to to preserve. We need to find a way to produce more sustainably, because whatever the case is, we we need to be able to feed um, all of these growing populations. With with limited resources and all of these pressures that we are feeling right now on 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 on, on our uh, ecosystems, so that that brings me to agriculture in 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 Africa. And I thought it would be good to help you visualize um, agriculture in in Africa and how this looks like. Uh, I took this quote from the World Economic Forum. When it comes to this part of the world in Africa. Close to seventy percent of of our population actually depend on agriculture or make some sort of living uh, through through agriculture. But agriculture looks very different here. I've been on a, a couple of uh, uh, field visits uh, in, a, in in certain parts of the U.S. and and when when you see uh, the fields there in 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 the, in the U.S., um, those are really huge, very big fields. Very uniform, clean, very nice uh, looking uh, uh, fields. And 
it's just like a few a, a handful of people working on that field. You know, ag agriculture looks very different uh, in this part of it. And I saw this picture that I really liked um, by uh, by Peter from Simit, which really re reminds me of of uh, my my days growing up. Um, my 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 mom's field would look like this. So this this picture really uh, kind of I really connected with this picture because it really reminded me of, me of my my mom. And I would typically be this little boy you see here, um, trying to cultivate the field with my mom. So usually when we talk farming in Africa, yes, you you would find some parts of Africa where you have fields similar to what you you, you would find in the Midwest. Um, but majority of of the farms you would you would find in Africa look something more like this. They they are small small fields, uh, with a, a lot of uh, uh, manual labor on 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 that. So this this perhaps can help you um, um, visualize a bit more how agriculture look look. Here. It's very very smallholder driven. More than sixty percent of 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 the continent really uh, uh, are in uh, in smallholder farming. And I like to use this image a lot because it also helps you to visualize when we talk Africa. Um, and, and we used to joke that sometimes you you travel and then uh, you mention you're, you're from Africa and then someone will say like, oh, hey, uh, I know this guy, he's from Africa as well. Um, yeah, Africa is really huge. And, and just for perspective, you can fit all of the US in Africa, at China, in the India, most parts of Europe, Japan, and then you you still have some lands to spare. This is how huge the continent is. It is a very multicultural um, uh, con continent that is quite quite complex and 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 diverse. All uh, right, but it's also a, a, a continent that is sitting with. Uh, Close to sixty percent of of the world's arable land, um, seventy nine percent of which it's it's not it's not being used, right? And we are talking about a continent where, depending on which report you read, we are, we are talking close fourteen to twenty twenty three percent contribution to to national uh, GDP. Um, I mean, to 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 the GDP of Africa coming from from agriculture. So, uh, agriculture in in Africa is just just food production. It it is an integral part of of the continent's um, uh, de de develop development, right? And we are talking about a continent that's right now around one point one point five billion people, projected to grow to somewhere around two point five by by twenty fifty. So this is a, a continent that is going to be uh, a really populous uh, uh, continent. That, and so, and, and and so there is there is a need for you to be able to fit such such a continent to to incorporate, incorporate that technology. So to give a bit more context again, um, if if you look at the the US, I'm, I'm trying to. I don't know how to make this bar disappear, but if you look at if you look at the U.S., uh, for instance, uh, you, you have a, a, a you have close to I think three a little above three percent of of the population of U.S. Um, no, sorry, one 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 point something percent, one point two percent of the population of the U.S. actually actively dependent on on agriculture or making their living through through agriculture. Um, uh, for for instance, um, the the entire U.S. perhaps uh, has the, uh, about three point point something, three point one five percent of of the the uh, the world's arable land, uh, and yet if you take a a, a a crop like corn, um, currently the U.S. is producing somewhere around one one hundred and seventy seven bushels per acre. Uh, and depending on which report you read, it is estimated that there, there are some parts of the US that are even producing more 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 than this, and I, I believe you would know bet, better than I better than I do. Uh, but if you contrast that with with Africa, you know, we're a continent that is sitting on like sixty percent of the global Ar arable land, where we have about sixty to seventy percent of the its population involved in some form of agriculture. If you take a, a crop like corn, we are doing. If you're lucky, 30 bushes per, per, per acre. 
So at, at this current trajectory, and if you're looking at all of those dynamics that I've just uh, shared uh, in the past few minutes, it, it's, it, it's going to be very difficult to feed a, a, a continent with, with such uh, low, low productivity. Um, and so you're, you're going to be, you're going to have to depend on, uh, on, on others who have le more, less people involved in agriculture feeding a continent that has so much potential uh, to feed itself and the rest of the globe. And, and, and what, what, what I'm essentially saying, um, essentially for, for us to be able to feed this growing continent, uh, there's no way we can do all of this without the use of ag, ag innovations, all right? And and that's, that brings me to the question of ag biotech and and why why ag biotech? And the simple answer is because because it, it makes a difference. And and I'll, I'll share share with you a few a few highlights. So this gentleman here is called Ken. Um, I met Ken at the, an agricultural conference here here in Nairobi where he shared his story. So Ken and his family have been cultivating this uh, small piece of land for some time now. And every time they, they cultivate this field, uh, somehow the, the crops fail, um, which led Ken's grandma to conclude that that particular land is cursed. Uh, and so this always discourages uh, Ken from, from cult cultivating this land. Um, not until Ken met the... Uh, uh, this organization called the Africa uh, Agriculture Transfer uh, Transformation um, uh, Africa Ag Agriculture Technology Foundation. Sorry, uh, in short, AATF. Um, the AATF had just developed a, a few conventional varieties that that they were looking for uh, small farmers to 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 test and and scale up, and they happened to meet Ken. Um, so. That year, when Ken's grandma uh, discouraged him from cultivating that piece of land that he claimed uh, is cursed and nothing does well on it, Ken's response was uh, that I have the seed to break the curse. Uh, and so despite all the advice not to cultivate that field, he went ahead and cultivated this new variety from, um, from AATF. And he did incredibly well. He has been cultivating that variety on that same cast land for several years now. And with the, the proceeds from this, this uh, small cultivation that he's been doing on that small piece of land, Ken has been able to take his, his uh, son to uh, um, uh, educate his son to, the, to master's level. So his son just graduated from uh, with a, a master's in, in, in communication and public relation. Managed to take the wife to uh, uh, a vocational training, um, and so you can see how just a simple hybrid technology helped this uh, uh, gentleman to just transform his entire entire family. This is not even biotech. This is just simple hybrid technology, and 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 his Ken Ken stories is not it's not um, kind of. Uh, yeah, an isolated story. I, I can give you another example of Alice. Now, what you see here, that doesn't look like much, um, but this is what Alice has been able to put together, uh, this building here, with proceeds that she got from cultivating some of these improved hybrid varieties um, from, from, from AATF. On, on a farm like this, you can see how still how small these, these farms are. Farms, uh, uh, farms are so essentially we, we know that this with improved uh in innovation you are able to increase um productivity take for instance all of these these these, uh, these experimental plots that you see here all of these plots each gives you 10 bushels of of, of, of yield so see how far we've come um with with, with innovation from when we were cultivating open pollinated varieties somewhere around the 1940s. You look at how much land you need to produce the same, same, same amount of yield um, when you transition to, to hybrid, for instance. Now layer on that additional technologies from, from biotech like herbicide tolerance or insect control, or even where we are headed now, which is short stature. You can see the difference 
even visually. Technology and innovation makes makes a whole lot of difference. You wouldn't believe that we still have in some some parts or regions of Africa, people still cultivating open pollinated varieties, very old varieties. And we're simply saying we need to make the transition from this to something that looks more like this. Right. This is this is how we would be able to feed a, a growing a growing continent. And we know these technologies work. I'll, I'll give you a more example. I'm sure many of you or all of you probably are aware of Fall Army One. This is uh, a pest that has been menacing the entire continent. I mean, I think the entire sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there, there isn't a country that has not been, been impacted yet. So you, an entire field uh, almost destroyed uh, just because of, of Fall Army One. Now, if you look at this picture here, this is the 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 biotech uh, the variety that is now insect uh, protected against uh, uh, such insect pests. Here you find the the comparator, the conventional varieties. Just looking at it alone, visually, you can see the difference that that these technologies can make, right? With a field that is looking like this, and transition to a field that is looking like this, very clean, resistant to the, these pests. And these these are the kinds of uh, of of technologies that we believe can make um, a, a big deal across the continent. Another crop is cassava, and I I I grew, I grew up on cassava, so I know how important this 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 crop is. Um, like one third of one third of, of Africans somehow get their starch um, or daily caloric needs from a crop like cassava, but they are. Viral diseases that that really can just wipe out an entire uh, an entire field, uh, right? Uh, and these are diseases that you don't often find. Um, how do you call it? Uh, host resistance within some wild relative that you can just easily breed breed into these these uh, preferred varieties. Yeah. Now, if you look at what this gentleman is holding here. And 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 what he's holding on on this this other other other, you can clearly see the difference. Um, this is the conventional uh, comparator. This is the the biotech uh, version of, of of this cassava. You can see how clean this looks. So imagine you have an entire field with such clean material, right? Um, this is the power of 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 this particular tech technology uh, that we are hoping. Uh, can be scaled up across the continent because then then we 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 really uh, need technologies like this. Another one uh, crop uh, is is cowpea. When you go to rural, most rural Africa, particularly in in western uh, West Africa uh, region, cowpea is a, an important contributor of their protein source. Um, then you have this maruka pest that can really uh, we have the larvae that can bore into these uh, pods. Um, and then they stay in there and just damage the the entire entire pot. Now you can spray, I don't know how, whatever pesticides you want to you want to spray because they are inside the pot. They become very difficult to con to control, right? Uh, and these are technologies. I mean, these are instances where you could use uh, te uh, technologies like like biotech to make a huge huge difference. If you go to Uganda. Uh, if you don't have a meal made of banana, you they, they would always say they, they've not had any meal yet the whole day. Uh, this is how important banana is in the air food system. Right. Um, a lot of them de depend on banana. And then you have all of these bacterial diseases that can just wipe out an entire uh, banana field, for instance. With, again, no host uh, resistance that you could easily uh, just use conventional breeding to 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 uh, to uh, to improve so instances like this you find biotech becomes really 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 central and here i'll just pause and say i mean we're we're not saying this is a silver bullet that solves all problems now if you come to africa there's this agriculture face a lot of problems now that the, the Many other problems that we face right now, including access to finance, access access to markets, uh, issues about urbanization, infrastructure, 
uh, the, the problems are, are, are complex. What we're seeing simply is that, I mean, there are some of these problems that can actually um, uh, be, be, ad be addressed using biotech. So biotech can be part of the toolbox to address many of these challenges, especially around issues of pest and disease management and um, cl climate issues of, of, of climate, climate resilience and uh, some of these outdated technologies that we are currently using um, in, in, in our, in our uh, continent. And, and we know it's safe, right? I mean, the, the academies of, uh, uh, the, the, the National Academies of, I mean, of, of, of years have come out clearly to, to uh, highlight the safety of, of this technology, right? There are several studies that have been conducted. There are many regulatory agencies that have scrutinized this and, and have proven this technology to be, to be safe. There are many countries that are approved this technology uh, for use as food feed uh, and, and are being cultivated globally. But the question is, why aren't we um, getting the same level of traction here in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa? We know how this also contributes to, to sustainability, right? Um, I wouldn't dwell too much on this, but this is a technology that can really help us produce sustainably. Um, but when it comes to this part of the world, and I, I know it may be similar in some parts of the US as well. Uh, you, this is, this is what, what you find, right? Um, it, it's a technology that has multiple interest, uh, groups, competing interests. Um, and so you find even some spillover from, from Western country, uh, where the Western part of the world, like Europe, uh, spillover into, into our Africa, where you're finding, uh, many being mobilized to to kind of uh, uh, fight fight against against this this technology. So that that becomes uh, really really uh, challenging to to deploy technologies when a lot of people are trying to campaign against this and and trying to uh, uh, pre pre prevent it, its adoption. Now that notwithstanding, I think the continent has made some some good progress. Even prior to 2016, when you look at this map, you would see a lot of grace uh, and just South Africa being the early adopter. Somewhere in the 1996-97s, um, a country like South Africa was very, very quick to uh, to adopt this, this, this technology. But the rest of Africa met this technology with a, with a, a policy blockade. They adopted policies that essentially stopped any further adoption of this technology in many of these African countries. Some put moratoria, others just put uh, laws that simply wouldn't permit any private company to, to deploy these technologies over there because they are so punitive. Yeah, so for a very long time, nothing was happening on the continent. But some some time getting towards the, the 2000s and 2010s, uh, 2016s, we started seeing quite a, a bit of a, kind of uh, a surge in, in in research activities. So many research activities happening in the um, uh, Western uh, West African region, the Eastern and Southern Africa region as well. We've seen many uh, research activities that that were, uh, were 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 coming up. Right. So countries began to realize. Uh, that this technology really uh, can can contribute um, to to national food, uh, food security, even though we still have a lot of opposition. But clearly, we are seeing some uptick uh, in the in the uptick of this this uh, technology across across Africa. So South Africa was an, an early adopter. Around 2016, uh, Sudan came on board, also started adopt, adopting some of these these uh, uh, crops. Um, by 2020, we've seen many of those uh, that are under research transition into, into commercial use. So where you see a green, those are where really uh, co commercial use is, is actually uh, underway. So you find additional countries coming on board like Iswatini and, and, uh, and, and Kenya come, coming on board, Ethiopia, Nigeria. As we speak today, Ghana, Ghana has also um, uh, approved uh, crops for for commercial use, and we're seeing other countries making a strong uh, uh, progress towards towards this um, a, a adoption. 
And generally, when you look at a trend, um, so unlike uh, in the developed world where, where you're looking more more towards globally traded uh, uh, commodities, here we are seeing traits like drought tolerance. Yes, we still see herbicide tolerance. We see pest spread re uh, resistance, but also nutrition re enhancement is becoming more and more um a common trait that is that is being worked on and if you can if you look at the, the crops that are being worked on these are not like your typical globally traded commodity maybe um soybean maybe corn uh, but those ones like cowpea and, and cassava banana uh, sorghum th these are really food security crops that that the um uh, uh, the, the continent is, is 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 working on and and so with the hope that we can Kind of uh, uh, future proof uh, and and build diversity in our in our food systems and and right now as of 2014 as I mentioned, uh, so you can see more and more countries coming uh, very close to commercialization, um, and then some additional ones coming on board uh, uh, with 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 research in 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 biotech as well. So we are seeing some promising trends um, in the in the uptake of of this this technology in. In, in 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 Africa, which is which is encouraging, and I think what will be more encouraging is for us to uh, build more and more partnerships that can drive this. Because right now, the key driver in these adoption trends that I've just highlighted is is partnership, and one such partnership I wanted to to highlight um, is is a project called the the, the, the Teller Maze Partnership. So if you recall those two stories I told you about uh, Kennedy and and, and Alice. Um, they happen to be cultivating these first first uh, conventional tegu hybrids here, uh, which which were were uh, released by this 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 Stella partnership. So this is a um, a, a group of uh, this is a, a, a donor led partnership. It's the Bill and Medi Melinda Gates Foundation and US Aid providing a kind of funding support to. Um, a group of national agricultural research organizations in in multiple countries, seven countries so far, and county, um, to to look into how to improve uh, maize, uh, corn corn varieties in 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 Africa. And they started with uh, conventional breeding um, for for uh, drought drought tolerance, and then somewhere towards 2016 realized. I mean, if you have drought tolerance and and the the crop is not insect protected, then then really, it's, I mean, the, the the value add there uh, is isn't isn't that much. So they decided to start negotiating for uh, the insect protection trade, and this is where Bayer came in, right? Where Bayer decided to donate, um, for royalty free some of our insect. Uh, uh, protection uh, uh, traits to this particular project. Um, and with that, they were able to produce the next uh, generation of, of, of crops that are now both, uh, what we call them, uh, drought tolerant, but also insect protected. And, and the goal here is to be able to deliver this into the hands of small older farmers uh, so, that, so they can, they can uh, boost the, uh, their, their productivity. Yeah, so seven countries that are participating in this project right now, and many of those uh, adoption trends that I highlighted, particularly for corn, is driven by this kind of partnership, right? Yeah. So I think the more of this partnership that we can get in, in, in Africa, at, at least to catalyze the process, uh, the better it will be for the continent. So at least then the, the next phase is for us to go uh, into the, uh, the, the, the scale-up phase. Um, so if if you look at this project and what it's done is is incredible right again if you look this is the the non gm maize and you look at the the the, the gm maize which usually called bt bt maize and the uh, insect infestation you can visually just by visiting the fields visually just see the difference right and it's not just the 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 visual difference that you see if you look at here the conventional checks and then you you find the 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 the, the non gm variety and the GM variety, you could clearly see the spike in uh, uh, in, in 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 productivity in, in terms of yield, um, and and this is because you are really uh, 
uh, guarding your yields against in, uh, in, insect uh, uh, the destruction, right? So if you're able to protect the plants, you're able to harvest more, right? And and 43%, that's quite a, a big uh, yield advantage for, for, for this crop. And this is something that really uh, we, we need to get into the to, to, to the hands of farmer. And if it, just looking at the 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 the, the, the cobs, right, that are harvested from from these fields, just just look at it. Uh, I don't even need to talk more about it. Just just look at the difference. Um, a, a trait like like BT trait makes uh, in um in 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 this particular uh, crop uh, when when you you harvest them, more cobs looking more uh, uh clean. Uh, very very field uh, crops compared to the the, the non BT uh, variety, varieties and the and the and the local the local checks. So usually this is what farmers would would cultivate on on their fields. So if you look at this and you look at this, I mean clearly any any farmer would would go for 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 these kind of varieties. And so clearly these kinds of partnership uh, are really uh, needed for us to be able to. Um, uh, to make a difference here on the continent. Uh, Laura, you let me know how I'm, I'm doing on time. Um, so what what does it take to You're good. get okay. So what does it take to be able to get these these technologies deployed in, in Africa? Um, and uh, as you can see the, the progress is is encouraging but it's not where we wish we would, would be by now. And 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 this is why because Deploying such such a, a technology in in Africa is is not just about science. Um, a lot of this is driven by politics, uh, on on the ground, which is unfortunate. Uh, but once you get to understand it, you know how to navigate some of these 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 these, these challenges, uh, because political will makes a big difference uh, down here, uh, whether or not a, a technology such as biotech is is is, is adopted. You need a lot of government commitment. You, you need the willingness of, of government to be able to allow these, these technologies uh, and even to incentivize the sector uh, and get the re relevant infrastructure um, uh, in, in place for, for technologies like, like, like this to be, to be successful uh, on the ground. Now, in many African countries, this is lacking. And so you find that the uh, deployment of such technologies have stalled or are completely non-existent right in other countries you, we are seeing more and more political will and i think a key driver is, is uh, this conflict between russia and ukraine that has put a lot of pressure uh on sub-saharan africa and so some of these leaders are looking for ways that they can produce more locally and i think some of them are beginning to realize this technology can contribute to that right so political will is a big deal the other one is technology acceptance. And I think this is the same for the US as well. Um, see all of this negative campaigning about, about biotechnology, uh, it, it gets the, the cons consumers uh, worried. Any any consumer will, will be worried if you are, you are reading all of these uh, things about biotech and how it causes cancer and, and, and causes, makes you sterile and all of those uh, conspiracy theories that are being uh, spewed out, out, out there. And so, um, if, if we don't have the continent to, to really understand this technology and perhaps have some trust, um, in, 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 uh, regulatory processes to, to assure their safety, it becomes really difficult to deploy a technology that people don't really want to use. Right. So, um, look, looking at the consumer needs, looking at how the public perceives the technology, all of that needs to change. Um, so that we can build enough awareness in a system for people to trust that this technology is safe enough for the, for them for them to use, and most importantly, transparency. And I, I think um, a lot of perceptions out there about how uh, corporate greed is driving all of this, and they're trying to just run through some unsafe product in, in India because they can buy every official in that country. Um, so. If, if we don't have enough transparency about the, the processes or, 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 or the, the, I mean, the regulatory processes that govern this, this, this technology and, and how these technologies come to market, it becomes really difficult to, to get the, the public to, to accept this kind of technology. And most importantly, and as, as I mentioned at the beginning, science-based policy frameworks become really important. I mean, the initial blockage that was put on this technology were through policies. Countries enacted policies 
that made it just impossible to deploy this te technology in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So getting science-based policies become uh, really, really uh, instrumental in the, in the adoption of these technologies. That means that these policies need to be disproportionate. Right, we, we need some simplification in the, uh, the data process clarity. Uh, we need to understand, have some predictability in the system, right? Uh, such that you know exactly how um, your your, your uh, submission will, will will be considered. Uh, should you put that in there, uh, and and what level of uh, uh, public access you you'd have to to such. Most importantly, these technologies are really uh, expensive to to to, to develop. Which means a company would only make these technologies available when they are confident that their uh, intellectual property will be protected. So this becomes a really important part of all of this puzzle uh, for us to be able to get these technologies where they are needed uh, the most in in in, in many sub-Saharan African countries. And I think many of the countries you go to uh, often you find weak enforcement of intellectual property uh, rules and. Or even non-existent sometimes, so it becomes really challenging to deploy some of these these technologies uh, across. And last but not least, is, is the institutional uh, support that is needed. And you find some of these donor-funded projects are providing this kind of institutional support um, for a technology that many African countries may not have worked on uh, before. You need to build some level of regulatory capacity. Right. So you need to uh, uh, resource the national institutions uh, to, to the point where they have ad adequate uh, technical capacity uh, to be able to uh, assess this or review these, these submissions and make actually make a science-based decision. Uh, but also, most importantly, being able to steward these, these technologies because there's a bit of technicality involved in, 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 in all of this. And so that kind of national uh, capacity building um, is improving in many African countries, but it's still a very big uh, gray area that needs to be improved if we are to be able to uh, deploy this this technology to benefit many farmers um, across across sub sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, in conclusion, and now if you don't uh, remember everything I've said so far, um, essentially th this is a technology. That that can make a whole lot of a difference in the life of a of a farmer here here in 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 Africa. Because here it's not just about producing food; it's people's livelihoods. Uh, and so, if we can get technologies that can help them to produce sustainably, we will be able to feed a growing continent, uh, and and we'll be able to improve people's livelihoods uh, in in do in doing so. And the only way we can do this is to make sure we have workable policy policies that 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 can en enable this this technology we need partnerships partnerships and more partnerships uh, because many private companies will perceive many african countries as, as too, too risky to just venture in there um and and what these partnerships are doing uh, especially funded by gates and and other other such partners um is is to to de-risk de de the, the the sector so if if you remove the risk uh, then you can get some of these uh, private companies, uh, companies to to help scale up uh, the the uptake of of these technologies. So partnerships are going to be really really uh, crucial in in driving the the adoption. And also, we need to be able to scale up for countries that are already in 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 research phase or maybe early adoption phase. Uh, we need really to resource them so they can scale up the the adoption of of these these technologies. So so we reach. Many of those seventy percent uh, smallhold, smallholder farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa who may require these these kinds of technology to boost their their food production. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for for having me, and th thank you for your time. And uh, a big thank to to uh, Laura and also Mark H for the support in in putting all of this together. Really appreciate that. And I'll pause here for any questions. Sorry, right. thank you. Yes. Thank you, Godwin. Such an awesome story. Thank you for sharing your experiences. And um, so, yes, we have several questions. Um, and so uh, one interesting question was about China and the influence of China. Uh, it says, 
um, in most sub-Saharan Africa has increased in the last decade? Is China's presence a catalyst or an impediment to the yeah. adoption of biotechnology oh. in Africa? Yeah, well, th thanks. Uh, that's a really interesting question, and, and we would love it to be a catalyst. Right now, ch China's um, uh, influence in the region is indeed really growing. Um, but when it comes to the agriculture space, we often find China taking a more neutral um, neutral uh, uh, approach. It's just in a couple of months, uh, I mean, months ago that we realized uh, China coming up with some of these uh, South-South co co uh, cooperations in terms of ag, ag research. Right now, when it comes to ag biotech, they've taken a really neutral stand. They are not really supporting. They're not really uh, against the technology itself. Um, but we are hoping with some of the do domestic developments happening in China right now, where they themselves are beginning to, to uh, uh, deploy some some of these technologies uh, domestically that this perhaps uh, will change how how they they approach um, the technology from from outside their their borders, especially in Africa. Um, but right now they they remain uh, neutral in, in their approach. Interesting. Um, also, there was a question about the Tela project and that it looks promising. And uh, the question was, how, what kind of approach are they taking? Are they mainly working with the farmers or also with governmental bodies? Yes, both. Um, they, 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 they are working with government research organizations to be able to, to develop um, these, these varieties. So for, for each country to go to, they would work, um, the, the, the country would have an agricultural research um, organization uh, that is government owned. And so they, they would work with that kind of organization to develop and test the varieties. Uh, and then they, they have within uh, the Teller project itself, uh, a, a unit that, that helps to kind of a farmer facing unit that is um, identifying and, 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 and enrolling these farmers into, into demonstrations. And I think the next phase, like as we speak right now in Nigeria, the next phase is to go um, to scale up, right? So they're identifying seed companies that they would partner with. Uh, the idea here being they would work with seed companies that would license these technologies from them, uh, royalty free, which means that the price would be reasonable in the market. And those seed companies would be able to then uh, sell this directly to their, to their uh, customers, which is the, the farmers. Um, so that that's the kind of arrangement that that happens within the Tela project. Excellent. Um, there was a question about mycotoxin contamination, which um, you and I had discussed earlier, and wondered um, uh, when you know corn is insect damaged. Yes. Uh, does this make it more susceptible to mycotoxin contamination? And is this an issue in Africa or just when the corn has to be stored over long periods? It, it, it is. It, it is a big issue. Mycotoxins uh, are a big issue here in Africa, especially um, with uh, the, the kind of storage facilities that, that we have. And you layer on that the insect damage that, that happens in the field with poor infrastructure for, for storage. It becomes a, a a safe haven for mycotoxin de development, and uh, Kenya is one such country where they are really they were really struggling with with my micro mycotoxins. Right, uh, it is a big issue, and we know uh, that uh, technologies like BT can can really help reduce the insect damage. Right, um, now I wouldn't claim BT stops mycotoxins, but being able to reduce that kind of insect damage really really helps. Uh, in minimizing uh, mycotoxin de de development. So we have often made this uh, argument to many government officials. If you're trying to minimize my mycotoxins in, in your country, then you should consider introducing some of these technologies that can minimize insect damage, um, such, such that you minimize the development of, of some of uh, these my mycotoxins. But aflatoxin is a big issue here in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and we think this technology can can, can help. Um, okay, so um, 
one of the first questions came up. Uh, there was a uh, about heirloom fruit or vegetable crops. Um, is there an interest in heirloom crops in Africa, or is this something that you've heard about? Um, so these are sort of older generation vegetables that people are trying to preserve the seeds and and use them over many generations. Uh, is that something that's so uh, yeah cool. yeah I, I haven't heard of that particular um i don't know if it's a project or or, or just the uh, seeds that people are trying to preserve now here in in africa some some of the concerns uh, that people would raise is about our native varieties that they want to preserve and and, and i think that's some of those concerns that have been raised is uh, you bring things like biotech um you wipe out native varieties, and and so uh, how how do you preserve some of those those native varieties? And I think some some of those uh, in many African countries are uh, where you find uh, the seed banks begin to play a very big role um, in making sure that whatever varieties that that needs to be preserved um, in any country uh, is is identified and 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 preserved through those those seed seed banks. Uh, so yeah, it is it is something that is has been discussed in many African in everywhere you go to discuss biotech in Africa, this comes up. Right. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so we had a uh a question or or sort of a uh request for um collaboration from uh John Sloan, who is an ACS member um in Africa. And uh, he works on a farm called uh, uh, Peace Farms, and uh, and so there's I'll I'll be sure to share this information with you. He gives that. a lot of information about his farm, and uh, he's interested in I guess collaborating on some of these higher yield uh, varieties. So I'll be sure to um, to share that with you. But I I did want to want him to know that I did see his his question and we will definitely follow up with with him. Absolutely. Um, there was a question about uh, soil quality. So um, there's been uh, a, an FAO report in 2015 on soil quality, indicating major negative trends in soil erosion and biodiversity. And um, do you know of any um efforts to think about soil quality in africa yeah. along these lines yeah i think they're there no, I, I can't remember them top of my head but there are quite a number of organizations that are, are really um uh, working on on soil health uh, some of these are being coordinated by the africa green Re revolution um uh, alliance agra for instance um, but aside Agra, I mean, there are m many other multiple organizations that are really concerned about soil health. I mean, at the end of the day, any good productivity starts from the soil. Uh, if you if you don't have a, a good good soil, that you can forget about uh, any any good harvest. Uh, so soil is getting more and more attention uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in the face of climate change. Uh, and so we are having to see a number of organizations that are partnering. Um, uh, along along that space, I'm, I'm ha happy to c compare some of this to share li later with the if, if if they're interested. Great, great, thank you. Um, one question is, what is your vision for the future of biologicals and ag biotech in in Africa, yeah. and how can we uh, support continued development and growth of regulatory frameworks for ag biotech in Africa? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, more and more, uh, we're seeing pressure on conventional uh, crop protection products in in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, a lot of that pressure coming from from again from Europe, right? Um, biologicals become uh, part of the, the the tool that 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 we can use in a, te a tele solution to support uh, uh, agriculture in, in in Africa. So it it is a very if you look at the um, um, the current interest in biologicals in Africa, it's, 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 it's gaining a lot of attention. Of course, there are concerns about efficacy and all of that, but 
but it is a topic that is gaining quite quite some some traction in in sub-Saharan Africa, and and so I I foresee that this would continue. Personally, my vision, I I I I really I'm I'm looking uh, I, I I'm I'm looking to see a continent where we we can break some of these policy barriers, right? Um, all of these barriers that we are putting to prevent access to some of these technologies being biotech if you think about biologicals how are we going to regulate biologicals that is not so over the top and not risk proportionate that you have nice good solutions biological solutions but they cannot make it to the pharma because uh they're such, such a tall regulatory barrier for you to cross right um so for me my, my vision really is to try and eliminate some of these barriers to to, to make sure that um across the continent that we can we can actually get some of these technologies to the hands of farmers and i foresee a, a continent in the future where farmers would have access to many of these biotech trades to biologicals to conventional crop rotation uh products to other digital tools in a in a tailored uh solution right i mean in a in a tailored form where you can actually tailor this to the to the needs of of, of the farmer uh in a in a kind of a systems approach uh, such such that they can have these technologies can coexist. I think it's it is the, the kind of vision I, I I have right now that the way that everywhere you go in Africa you can have access to any of these technologies that you need to be able to 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 make your your farm your farm work. Okay. Um. And so uh, one question was: Is there an OECD like agreement among African countries to streamline regulatory acceptance? Yeah. Is this likely or possible? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Now, um, th there are discussions ongoing now on harmonization of regulatory processes. Um, so it's happening in various regional blocks. It's it's happening in the West, the, uh, West African uh, region, also in the Southern Africa region. It's ongoing. The commercial region is is also happening. So those those discussions are happening um, to to various degrees. Uh, the, the challenge is implementation. So, for instance, Comesa finished uh, th this process quite like like ten years ago, and and they have a, a document that was never implemented. Right? So the intent is there. It's more of how do you implement a process like this that that has like taken taken forever uh, right now in many African countries. Otherwise. The other uh, opportunity we are seeing right now is the Africa uh, Continental Free, Free Trade Agreement that was just uh, adopted. Um, so this is trying to eliminate trade barriers across Africa. And we we're hoping some of these components about seeds and uh, technologies and biotech would find its way there. So we can force this kind of harmonization uh, from a trade perspective for all of continental Africa, right? So that's... that's um, uh one one opportunity that we see in that in that space okay so we're down to our last minute so i'm going to uh just show i'm going to thank you uh godwin so much for this talk today it's i think it's been one of the best agro webinars that i can remember um i learned so much um uh, with this, and I just I want to uh, just remind people that um, we have a couple more webinars to come uh, in April and May, and the the titles and speakers are listed here. And you can contact Salido Sumalong uh, if you want to join the webinar committee. I know he would appreciate any help that you may want to. Um, pitch in and or if you have any ideas for webinars I'm sure he'd be happy to hear those as well um, and you can also look at previous webinars on the agrodiv.org uh, website so again I want to thank Godwin for this great webinar and I know that you've gotten a lot of people interested in this topic and uh, we still have more questions we couldn't cover all the questions that we had unfortunately but um, hopefully people got a good sense from uh, 
your your answers that you gave, which I thought were pretty uh, high level and um, overarching. So again, thank you everyone for joining and oh. hope to see you at the next agro webinar. Thank you for having me. Bye everyone.